in your fundamental physics class, you are going to be talking about friction quite a bit. So the force of friction on an object, you may recall from your kind of forces chapter, is going to be the um, force which is kind of opposing motion in some way. Now, there are kind of two particular friction forces that you are going to be talking about. One of them is static friction, and then the other one is kinetic friction. So what's the difference between them? Well, the word static means that really there is no motion at all. And kinetic means that you are in motion. So you're actually moving. Now, if you're talking about static friction, and let's concentrate on that one first. So what would that mean? Well, if you have an object and you draw the free body diagram, and you start to apply a force to that particular object. So if I would take this force right here, and if I apply this force, now, if it's not going to be big enough, say it's if it's a rather small force, so as I have it right there, and it is going to be smaller the uh, against the force of friction, which is basically trying to prevent the object from moving and you can test this yourself. You can put a book and you can put anything down and you will try to push it. Originally, it's not going to really move. You're going to have to apply a certain amount of force to be able to make it move. Now, eventually, if you apply enough force, you're going to get to the point where your applied force is going to be equivalent to your um, force of friction, which is keeping this thing static meaning in no motion. Now, that particular point as you're applying it, okay, so that breaking point where you finally get to move it is known as the maximum static force of friction. So anything below it is not gonna make the object move. Now, what is actually preventing this movement? Well, it's the actual materials that the two objects are made up of, the object that you're trying to move and then the surface that it is being, you know, kind of attached to. So the materials that you have are not the only item that will determine this. The actual conditions, okay, of the two, okay, will also have an impact. So for example, if it's dusty, if it's wet, and if it's real wet, um, the imperfections, okay, in the actual two surfaces will going to have an impact on that static friction. So you can take the same object and you might think that you might put it on something which is of similar surface. So let's say if it's on wood, you put it on another wood and you might notice, hmm, I don't need as much force to be able to move this now. Why isn't it the same? Well, that's because the actual imperfections and the surfaces that you're dealing with are not going to be exactly the same. So the force that you need to apply is going to be slightly different. So now this static friction, okay, that we have, we typically will designate it instead of just writing force of friction at random, we might actually say that this is going to be the force, okay, of friction, and then we might associate a little S to make it static. Now, this is just a convention, and typically, you know, you might even drop the force, the F, okay, that's attached, and you might just simply put a little S for static friction it is always going to be opposing the applied force that you have. And it is going to be resisting it until it can no longer resist anymore. So what is very interesting is that the static friction, if you would be um, trying to graph this, okay, throughout, so if you recall your X and Y, okay? So for example, if you have something like this, and here is your applied force, okay, that you have. And I'm going to only talk about the magnitude, so the direction is going to be opposite. And then on the vertical, you know, you have your force of friction, okay, that is applied. So now, originally, what you will find for any two surfaces that are in contact, you will find that as you apply this force, so if maybe if it's a particular force that's applied, your force of friction okay, that you have, so this is your force of friction, is going to match the actual applied force because the object's not moving. Now, where does that come from? Well, it comes from kind of two Newton's laws. First law, right, so an object is going to remain at rest, okay, 
So that's one if the net force is equal to zero. And then from Newton's third law, for every action, you have a reaction. So for your applied force that you have, well, the reaction force is going to be the actual force of friction that is trying to prevent it. And that's actually why objects will remain kind of in static or in no motion. And you can keep applying this and the force of friction is going to continuously match okay, your applied force. And it basically looks like it's kind of linear, like it's just almost like a straight line. It basically matches whatever you apply, the force of friction matches it. Whatever you apply, it matches it. Whatever you apply, it matches it. Until eventually, okay, what's going to happen, I'm going to remove this, eventually what's going to happen is if you keep applying this at some point, okay, there's going to be a maximum. And that is the force, okay, of the static friction that can withstand the actual applied force. And that again is due to the materials, the conditions, the imperfections in those materials, okay, that's keeping them, okay, static. But at some point it will break and it's going to start to move. In particular, it's going to accelerate for a short period of time, okay, as you apply that force. And during this particular time, so from this applied force to this applied force, or during this time, okay, it is static. It is not moving, and that's the force, okay, that you will have. Now, what's very interesting is that notice that you have your applied force, okay, and then you have your maximum force at some point. And what we do in physics, we actually apply and provide something which we call a coefficient of friction. And that coefficient of friction, okay, we designate with a Greek letter. So this is mu or just a u, okay? Um, so this mu that you have is going to be a coefficient of friction. And it's going to have and relate it back. So if you put a little s here, so this means, okay, the static one. And how it's defined is that maximum force right? So this maximum force that finally, if you break this, okay, if you go over it, the actual object's going to start moving on that surface. Now that is related back to the force of normal. Now, if you recall your force of normal from your free body diagrams, you have your force of gravity, and then you have your force of normal. And that force of normal is always perpendicular to the actual surface of that actual object. Now, this force of normal for most of the time is going to be equal to the force of gravity, but it's not always equal to the force of gravity because that will depend on what is happening with that object. So please recall and remember that if you have a ramp and you put an object on it, the force of normal is in this direction, yet the force of gravity is down and they won't actually necessarily equal to each other. So we define this coefficient of friction as basically, okay, just almost like a ratio. It's a division between the maximum that you have, okay, and the force of normal that you have for that object. And if you do that division, you will find what this coefficient of friction is. And it will be different for many items. So depending on what you're dealing with, which surfaces you, you have, okay, so that force, okay, is going to be different. So it could be on wood, you know, it could be on aluminum, it could be on steel, it could be on whatever it is, you know, you might have rubber as well. So that force, okay, of friction, that maximum is going to change. And therefore, for any object that you have, you know, the object might be the same, okay, the force of normal might be the same, but it's going to have a different maximum for whatever surface that you're dealing with or material that you actually have. And therefore, you're going to have a different coefficient of friction. So I hope that that should make sense to you, right? And this actually comes from everyday life. You'll know that if you put an object and you try to move it, well, and initially, it's not going to try to move. It's going to try to resist that motion. And that is called the static friction that's resisting. And it will continuously match your applied force until it can no longer match. So it will do the minimum, okay? If it can... Right? So that's why you have this line. So notice if you put very little applied force, well, then there's very little force of friction. It's almost like it's playing you. It's that action and reaction. Okay? And it will keep trying to match what you're putting in until eventually it says, ooh, this is a little too much. Okay? And I can't resist anymore. And the object starts to move.
and that is related to this coefficient of friction. So if we know what this is, now we find this out by experiment. So physicists, scientists will do, or engineers will do all kinds of experiments to try to find these. And once they find these, then they can define this coefficient of friction and they can say, oh, for steel, it is this number. For lead, it is this number. And that will depend on the material that you have. And in fact, there's actually tables. You can look them up. So, you know, I kind of just scan through. So here's a particular table. This is from the engineering toolbox, okay, dot com. And I just put, you know, what's the coefficient of friction. And so here, notice that what you have is you have the material, okay? And these are the materials that are in combination. So, you know, one material with another material, okay, that you have, okay, in there. So because you have two of them, and then it tells you what's the surface condition. So notice it says clean and dry, and then it gives you a static, right? So that little static coefficient. Now we're gonna get to kinetic in just a moment when you actually start to move. But you'll notice that you know you have this static coefficient, okay, within there, and that's what it will take, okay, to actually break that movement. And then notice you have other ones, so aluminum and aluminum, which is on a lubricated or maybe greasy surface. Notice the static Okay, coefficient is much less because that maximum is not going to be as much if it's basically a greasy surface. And you can keep going and you can find, you know, all of these different ones. So you notice that in there I can see brick, okay, on a wood piece of paper, you know, static, okay, so that's a clean and dry condition and there's lubricated conditions and so on. So you always have these two, okay, materials that are going to be, okay, um, within each other and you're trying to find to see, all right, what is that coefficient, okay, that you have. Now that coefficient is very important, okay, because then we can find out, so if I go back in here, so if you really wanted to find out what that maximum is, right, you certainly can do that because then you can just take any object that you have, you can find this force of normal, and then you can rearrange this and then find what this maximum is. So if we have a basically table of these coefficients, then I can rearrange this. I can move this to this side, multiply it by the actual coefficient of friction, and then I will find out what this maximum is for that object. Obviously, Fn will depend on the mass, right? So it's in some particular way, okay, proportional to it. So that normal force will depend indeed on the force of gravity in some particular instances, and actually in most, especially if it's exactly vertical to each other okay so you can certainly find this out if this is given now if they give you this and they give you this or if you're doing your own experiment right where you're just moving and maybe you have a measuring tool that measures the amount of applied force you have and then you just keep moving 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 and eventually goes oh it moved here so you can then approximate what that maximum was then you can find out, okay, well, what was the force of normal, okay? That's just if you have a, let's say, a horizontal surface, and then you can calculate your own coefficient of friction. So you can do that as well. Now, what happens when the object starts to move? Well, now it is in motion. And motion, okay, so what we refer to as motion is, we call that kinetic. And you may hear this word, you know, kinetic motion, and you may remember, so, you know, kinematics, Right? So as you were studying it typically in your first chapter okay, or second chapter in your foundational physics course, well, that just meant you know, what happens when you are moving. Right? So because there's not much action happening here when things are static, but when they are moving, when they have a certain velocity, maybe they're accelerating, then you talk about kinetics. So that is now motion. And that happens when this is broken. Okay? So once you break this, then you go into kinetic. And for this, what you have is, I'll write it on the opposite side, so you basically have the force of friction, so you can still put a little F and you might put a little K, but most of the time in textbooks and your teachers might just simply put a little K right there, okay, just to make it very clear that it is the force and it's the kinetic force. So now what will happen is that if this box is now moving, well, then there's gonna be a kinetic force and that's going to be the friction. It's still opposing the movement, so you might still be applying it, okay? But it will try to oppose this. And this typically is measured, so when we are measuring this kinetic motion, so initially you will accelerate. But then at some point, 
okay so after a little bit of time maybe you're going to come and maybe you're going to be moving at a constant velocity now remember moving at a constant velocity then there's no more acceleration so you know you have to now so if you're still moving then you still have a net force of zero which means your applied force and the force of friction will cancel each other off but you're in motion you now have a constant velocity and that is so what is that opposing well that's the kinetic friction that is opposing your applied force they just turn out to cancel each other so they're equal to each other and typically what happens this is not always the case but okay so typically what will happen is this maximum it's not going to be as high as that you don't necessarily have to maintain it it actually typically drops off a little bit and then you need a certain amount of force okay to still keep it going so for the applied force that you have you know your actual kinetic force is going to be more or less constant that you have in there and this is typically the assumption that you have and this would be referred to as your kinetic friction that you have so whenever we have something in motion and we're putting this in here and this is the force of friction really we're referring to the kinetic friction in there so we could replace the little f for friction and then we can just put a little k but typically okay we might still utilize just this force of friction in here because maybe it's also okay in taking into consideration other things not just the actual two surfaces touching each other right you also have a force of friction from air resistance for example right as the object moves but this is not what we're referring to here so here what we're referring to is just the contact between the two materials that you have that's the kinetic friction that we're referring to the air resistance typically may also be called the drag we don't necessarily refer to that in here right as you're stun starting your foundational physics so for example for kinetic friction you might have all kinds of other um, frictions okay that come into play and these particular frictions so if maybe the object is you know sliding along okay in some uh, particular way or rolling so you know if it's not you know this box shaped so maybe it's circular shaped so now it's rolling so there's going to be a rolling friction that's also a kinetic friction that's not what we're referring to here right you may also have okay, in terms of not just rolling maybe you have okay it's going through a fluid okay so you would have fluid friction maybe it's going through air so you'll have air resistance now these typically may also be called the drag so you might hear that okay the word drag which is basically the friction in motion through various okay so fluids or air and that certainly is a force of friction but and they're all kinetic because the object is moving but in here, when we are referring to force of kinetic friction, we typically are talking about the force of friction that is between two materials at the two surfaces. So it excludes these. So it doesn't really talk okay, or take these into consideration. So please keep that in mind. So when you're looking these things up, so for instance, if I go back to this table, so now if I look to the right, you know, notice the coefficient of friction, right so now what is that coefficient of friction so for kinetic well that now be because there's no maximum so what you have is your the force of force okay of the kinetic friction divided by the um, force of the normal of the object and i'll show you that equation in a moment but you see there on the right hand side so you have a different right and notice the numbers are different and notice that for most of them okay they typically will be less um, now the aluminum and aluminum is interesting because the kinetic friction in terms of sliding on a clean and dry surface is actually a touch okay a little bit above and that's rare so notice if you have aluminum and mild steel notice that kinetic coefficient is going to be less notice that when you have brass and steel again it's a little bit less and that is very typical you typically will have it less it's very rare that it will be above it all right and these are again so this is just materials that you have okay in contact between each other okay and as you're going along you know you'll see them and you can take a look and as as the ones that you have on the left and then on the right one is static the other one is kinetic okay in terms of the coefficient and where it's coming from so here if i scroll back down so here's your equation for kinetic so here we typically will put a little k 
So now we know that it's in motion. It's between two objects touching each other, basically kind of sliding through each other. And you take the force of the kinetic, okay? And then you divide it by the normal. So that's exactly the same. Notice you have normal in both. But in the force of the static, okay, you need the maximum right here. So that determines our coefficient. In here, okay, the force of kinetic is typically determined when the object is moving at a constant speed. So F net is still equal to zero. And that's what you're trying to find to see what you need to maintain it in movement. And then you can find this out again. So if you know this for two surfaces, you can multiply it. So you can switch it over here and then you can find your okay, kinetic um, actual force. And that would have been this force, okay? And that's coming from the two surfaces touching each other. And again, it's dismissing these, right? So not fluid, not air resistances. Those would be extra that we would take into consideration if needed. So there you have it. So that's kind of the introduction, okay, that you have in here. You know, things to remember. Static, okay, is the force of friction. That's really not allowing this object to move. Kinetic is the force of friction when the object is typically moving, and it's assumed that it's kind of moving at a constant, okay, velocity, that's how it's measured. If it is accelerating, it still does have a kinetic friction, and you can still utilize this, and typically we will do that. So as a student, you know, we typically take that and use the approximation, so we will find this out, and then find out what this will be if, the, if we are lucky enough to know what the two surfaces are. We can do these, simply by experiments. This isn't something that you calculate. It's not like a formula that you have. Um, engineers, scientists, physicists will do these by experiments. And really there's no other way because of the imperfections and the conditions that typically come up. And you will notice that it's sometimes, okay, they'll be giving you ranges. So here you notice that in, for example, static friction, you know, you might have okay, a single item but you also may have a range and you can see that range kind of in the middle there between you know carbon and carbon okay so notice they give you a little bit of a range and that can certainly happen right so the other numbers that you have if they're single they're typically kind of approximations that engineers will use okay throughout but you don't always have just a single number you may actually have some kind of a range notice the aluminum and aluminum on top and that is coming from the imperfections Okay, that you are carrying through. The formulas that you're carrying out are gonna be these ones. So you do have a coefficient of friction because then you can attach it directly to the two materials. And those you can calculate, they're very simple. So notice it's just okay, a numerator and a denominator. You're dividing them okay, with respect to static and kinetic. All right, so I don't wanna get into much more in this one. Okay, I'll try to present uh, an example or two in another video. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope that you uh, can give it th a thumbs up and it has helped you. Okay, bye everybody.